Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar um, on uh, the um, 75th anniversary of the Security Council and the current challenges. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, joined today, today with uh, such a distinguished group of uh, colleagues um, and um, we will uh, certainly have uh, interesting discussions on the role of the Security Council. Uh, the Security Council has um, met for the first time this year, actually this year in January, um, and uh, 75 years ago. And uh, this webinar is intended to explore the current challenges uh, faced by this fundamental organ in the UN architecture. Uh, in particular, it will look at uh, um, the Security Council and the issue of the rule of law, the relationship with International Criminal Court, issues on its agenda such as climate change and protection of civilians, and also the Security Council viewed from a 12 perspective, their world approaches to international law. Um, let me first um, start by uh, welcome, welcoming the co-sponsors um, of uh, this event, um, Susanna Vashpat, who is uh, the director of the legal department of the Department of Legal Affairs in the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, Nilofer Oral, who is the director of the Center uh, for International Law. So let me give the floor to you first, Susanna. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, it is uh, a great pleasure for the legal department of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of, of Portugal to be hosting uh, this event today in partnership with the Center for International Law of the University of Singapore. A few years ago, the department, uh, um, our department started a series of annual uh, conferences to, to promote the debate on current topics of international law within and uh, uh, outside the Portuguese uh, MFA. We have held uh, annual conferences among others in topics like uh, humanitarian assistance, crime of aggression, uh, current challenge uh, to international humanitarian law and so on. Uh, the proceedings of these conferences uh, have been published in the Portuguese yearbook of uh, international law. And these conferences were organized in partnership with Portuguese Academia, uh, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, but also the Portuguese Red Cross National Society. Um, we, we always had the, the chance to have uh, um, with us the participation of academics and practitioners both from Portugal and, and, and abroad. Last year, uh, in, the, in the context of the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, we had planned to dedicate uh, our annual conference to the Security Council and its current challenges. But due to the pandemic situation, we had to postpone the conference. Uh, and, uh, uh, and today we are thrilled to not only have uh, um, the conference uh, uh, finally, and, and it's taking place uh, uh, today, but, but also um, our virtual uh, new world has, has opened possibilities uh, to even further collaborations uh, between institutions around the world. I am extremely, extremely grateful to the Center uh, for International Law for having partnered uh, with us on this initiative. And I would like to express my appreciation to our excellent panelists that have accepted to share their views on this important topic. Security Council is now 75 years old and it remains central to the architecture of the UN Charter. The challenges it faces continue to call for our reflection and debate. Portugal has been um, a member of the Security Council for three times now and is a candidate for a non-permanent seat in uh, 2027, 2028. Um, in our last mandate in 2010-2011, I was posted in, uh, at our mission uh, in, in New York and I had the chance to witness um, the Security Council in action and the important role that the Council has in, in promoting the rule of law and accountability. Looking back at Syria, at Rwanda, Darfur, um, and the former Yugoslavia, uh, there were situations where the, 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 the Council, confronted by horrific uh, human rights crimes, acted uh, on behalf of justice. 
but clearly more needs to be done. Um, I sincerely hope that the, 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 today's event will contribute to a better understanding of the challenges facing the Security Council and how international law can contribute to the maintenance of peace, international peace and security. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna and Milofer. Uh, it's my pleasure to pass the floor or <laughs> the screen. <to> <clears throat> Thank you so much, Patricia and dear Susanna. As a director of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to the webinar on the UN Security Council at 75 Current Challenges, um, co-hosted by the uh, Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and this, our center here in Singapore. And I thank my very dear colleague, who is also co-director of the CILE Academy of International Law, uh, Professor Patricia Gavawatelas, and Susana Baspato, the Director of Legal Affairs at the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for inviting CIL to co-host this webinar commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Security Council, albeit, I understand, delayed by one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This panel also marks the first of our CIL Public International Law webinar series, and Patricia and I hope you will continue to join us for future sessions. Today or tonight or this morning, wherever you are, we have a truly stellar panel of scholars and international law experts who will share with us their insights from different perspectives concerning the challenges facing the Security Council 75 years later. It is indeed a very different world than when 75 years ago, the council was established. Then there were 11 council members, including the P5, and a total of 51 UN member states. 75 years later, there are 15 council members with still the same PI and 193 UN member states. As the United Nations has expanded, so have the multiplicity of challenges faced and the nature of threats to peace and security. In addition to the traditional threats to international peace and security, uh, in the 21st century, new threats are emerging from non-traditional sources, such as climate change. While the Security Council has been under criticism for different reasons, and no doubt these will be discussed in today's panel, it is important that it also turns its attention to non-traditional threats, such as climate change, which is currently on its agenda. Indeed, our UN Secretary General uh, Guterres, in his recent statement to the Security Council, stated that, quote, climate change is a crisis multiplier that has profound implications for international peace and stability. I am very much looking forward to hearing from our most distinguished panelists and thank each and of them for being with us virtually today. So I wish everyone a wonderful panel and I look forward to, to listening. Thank you so much, uh, Susana. Thank you so much, Nilofer. Um, and thank you to the Portuguese um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Legal Department and the CIL for having partnered up uh, to co-sponsor uh, this event. Um, and a special thanks also to Jerry and Matthew uh, who are uh, in the background making sure that everything runs uh, smoothly. And so now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our speakers uh, for today's webinar. Um, we, as Nilofer said, we have a stellar panel. Uh, I think we couldn't have uh, better uh, colleagues uh, to um, address the challenges uh, that the Security Council is facing and uh, in some way has faced since uh, its inception. And we have uh, together um, a group of um, uh, colleagues who uh, are experts, uh, both from the academic point of view, but also from a practitioner's point of view um, on the work of the Security Council. Uh, so I welcome um, very much um, Niels Blocker, Professor Niels Blocker from University of Leiden, um, who is a specialist in international organizations and in international institutional law. Um, he has uh, written 
um, about the Security Council um, a lot, and he's also a practitioner, having been in the past um, legal advisor also in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, I also welcome my very dear colleague, uh, Diret Ladi, Professor Diret Ladi from University of Pretoria, and um, also a colleague of uh, Nilfar and myself at the International Law Commission. And, and Dire, um, not only being um, an academic with an interest uh, on issues of uh, peace and security, um, he has also um, worked as a legal advisor to so the South African Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, including at the South African Mission uh, in New York um, uh, during the period, I believe, when both Portugal and uh, South Africa were uh, both last members and non-permanent members of the Security Council. And so it's a great pleasure also to have you with you uh, with, with us. And uh, in particular, I also wanted to highlight um, that Professor Dirit Ladi has also uh, represented uh, both South Africa and, um, uh, and the African Union uh, before the International Criminal Court. And this is relevant because it will be addressing the Security Council and the ICC relationships. And then I would like to warmly welcome also uh, Shamala Kania Thompson, um, who um, is um, a member of the Security Council Report, um, which is an organization uh, for those who know, um, I, I think a, a fundamental institution association that uh, follows the work uh, of the Security Council and has uh, enormous information, uh, impartial information on the work of the Security Council. And certainly, I think any of us that want to uh, dig into issues that uh, are before the Security Council, go and, and check out the website of the Security Council report and the reports that you produce. Um, uh, Shamala is also uh, has a link, I think, with um, uh, the host institution, uh, one of the host institutions of uh, uh, this um, uh, webinar, because she's, uh, I think she was a former student from uh, the National University of Singapore, and she's also had been uh, working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore uh, before uh, going to New York and joining the Security Council report. And last but not least, uh, we have dear Professor Anthony Angie, uh, Professor uh, of International Law at NUS um, and also at uh, CIL, um, who is an expert, I would say, uh, one of the leading experts um, on the third world approaches to international law. And uh, I have suggested to him that he would look um, for uh, uh, that approach um, in regards to the Security Council. And I'm sure that he will bring us very interesting insights. So it's a wonderful um, panel that we have before us. Uh, I think you, you all agree with that with us and uh, we have I think also I wanted to highlight um, that we try to have this panel and um, also in terms of diversity of backgrounds mixing both an academic and partition backgrounds and also having um, different um, uh, regions of the world represented uh, uh, both from Europe, uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, so without further ado I would like to give the floor first uh, to Professor Niels Blocker um, and then I will do that successively with the other panelists. Um, and after that, we will open the floor for a discussion um, among the panelists and uh, certainly uh, also taking questions from uh, the audience that I understand is growing and also um, is uh, a bit from all over the world. And so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and you'll be able to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will try uh, to address them in the discussion period. Uh, so let me first uh, give the floor to Professor Niels Blocker, um, uh, who will uh, talk to us about the Security Council and the rule of power and the rule of law. Uh, Niels, uh, up to you. Thank you, Patricia. And I also thank the Department of Legal Affairs of the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore for the invitation and for organizing this webinar. In my presentation, I would like to present two pictures of the Security Council. In painting these pictures, I will use the chiaroscuro, the clair the contrast of dark and light of the rule of power and the rule of law. 
in chiaroscuro paintings, dark and light give depth. And for our understanding of the Security Council, we need both perspectives. One picture will show the Security Council at its creation in 1945. The other one will show it at present. Before presenting my two pictures using this chiaroscuro perspective, let me first briefly explain the two notions, rule of power and rule of law. The rule of power is not a generally established concept like the rule of law. I use it to refer to reign by the whims of those in power, based on the arbitrary and robust control by force if necessary. It is the opposite of the rule of law. As Arthur Watts once wrote, quote, the rule of law is the counterweight to political power, unquote. A key element in the notion rule of law is the idea that those in power should exercise their powers not as they please, but in accordance with the law. A more detailed definition was given by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2004, and I quote, the rule of law refers to a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards." Unquote. So the rule of law is a principle of governance. According to Tom Bingham, it is the rule of law that makes the difference between good and bad government. The notion rule of law is mostly used in the domestic context. Should rule of law standards also apply to international organizations? The logical answer is yes. After all, if the rule of law is a principle of governance, it should also be applicable to governance at the international level. The English term rule of law is therefore better than how this is translated into other languages with reference <coughs> to the state, rechtsstaatlichkeit, l'état <coughs> de droit, <coughs> I'm sorry, etc. If states need to comply with the rule of law, why should international organizations that they create not need to do so? This was fully recognized by the UN General Assembly in its 2012 Declaration on the Rule of Law, in which it stated, quote, that the rule of law applies to all states equally and to international organizations, including the UN and its principal organs, and that respect for and promotion of the rule of law and justice should guide all of their activities and accord predictability and legitimacy to their actions. Using these two notions, the rule of law, the rule of power, let me now present to you my two pictures of the Security Council. First, how it was in 1945, and next, how it is at present. The Security Council was created in 1945 as a political organ, as the ICJ observed in its first advisory opinion in 1948. It is no doubt <coughs> governed by the rule of power. This is how it was meant to be. In 1945, there was full agreement that the League of Nations and its members had failed. The Security Council was created as a strong enforcement body, much stronger than the League Council, which did not have such far-reaching powers and could only take decisions unanimously. No world peace and justice without strong centralized enforcement power, confirming what Blaise Pascal wrote in 1669, La justice sans la force est impuissante. Thus, it was agreed from the outset that the Security Council was to be governed by the rule of power. The Security Council is not only governed by the rule of power, to an important extent, it is also governed by the rule of the superpowers, epitomized in the right of veto for the P5. At the UN Conference on International Organization in San Francisco, 1945, it became more than clear that almost all participating states other than the future veto holders were unwilling to immediately accept as a fait accompli the veto as proposed in the Yalta Agreement. The veto became the most difficult issue of the negotiations. For the future P5, their veto privilege was a conditio sine qua non for UN membership. And during the San Francisco conference, it was clear to everyone that without their membership, the World Organization would be a non-United Nations, ineffective and powerless. 
it was clear in particular to the 45 delegations other than the future P5 that they had no alternative but to accept the veto. This was underlined by a US delegate who asked if delegates could face public opinion, and I quote him now, at home, if they reported that they had killed the veto, but had also killed the charter, unquote. These negotiations on the veto also illustrate that the Security Council was to be governed by the rule of power. The next question is whether at its creation, the Security Council was also governed by the rule of law. At first glance, this question does not seem difficult to answer for at least two reasons. First, the Council was established by international law, the UN Charter, defining its powers, its composition. The ICJ not only observed in its first advisory opinion that the Security Council is a political organ, but also that, quote, the political character of an organ cannot release it from the observance of the treaty provisions established by the Charter when they constitute limitations on its powers or criteria for its judgment, unquote. Secondly, the rule of law is a rather broad expression. It will not be easy to find a government that is against the rule of law. And therefore, why should this be different for international organizations? If states embrace the rule of law at the national level, they must be presumed to also follow it at the international level. In foro interno, in foro externo. However, on closer analysis, the question whether the Security Council is governed by the rule of law is more complex. Does the Security Council have carte blanche in carrying out its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security? Or is it bound to operate within certain limits? Article 24, paragraph 2 has the main answer stating that in discharging its duties, quote, the Security Council shall act in accordance with the purposes and principles of the United Nations, unquote. It does not say the Security Council shall act in accordance with the rule of law or with international law. Still, the reference to the purposes and principles of the United Nations implies some limitations. Also, because Article 1 refers to the principles of justice and international law. A fundamental discussion took place in 1945 on the reference to these principles in Article 1 of the Charter, and I will come uh, to this shortly. The UN Charter itself does not refer to the notion rule of law as such, even though it was mentioned by a number of delegations in the 1945 San Francisco Conference. <clears throat> At the same time, a number of charter provisions cover some of the substance of what is often understood to be part of the rule of law. Examples are references in the preamble to fundamental human rights, to equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small and to the establishment of conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. Therefore, ICJ President Yusuf rightly stated in June last year that the Charter, I quote him, laid down the foundations of the rule of law at the international level. The defining moment for the discussion on the rule of law and the Security Council was some two weeks before the end of the San Francisco Conference in June 1945. This discussion was about the text of Article 1 of the Charter, referring to the purposes of the New World Organization. The negotiations in San Francisco did not start from scratch, but on the basis of a draft text prepared during the 1944 the Barton Oaks Conference. This draft text mentions as a first purpose of the organization, and I quote, to maintain international peace and security, and to that end to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace, and to bring about by peaceful means adjustment or settlement of international disputes which may lead to a breach of the peace. Well, I'm sure you will recognize this text. It's very close to what is now in Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the Charter. I will now focus on the words in this uh, draft from the Barton Oaks that were, or on the words uh, that were added actually in San Francisco some eight months later. In 1945, at this uh, NGO conference, the main bone of contention regarding this first purpose of the UN was whether this provision, now in Article 1, Paragraph 1, should also include a reference to justice, law, rule of justice, rule of law, or closely related notions. 
The outcome of these negotiations is reflected in the current Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the Charter. And if this article is compared to the De Barton Oaks draft that I just quoted, the main addition are the words in conformity with the principles of justice and international law. The addition of these words, and in particular their position within Article 1, Paragraph 1, were the subject of intense negotiations in San Francisco in June 1945. There were two views. According to one view, let's call this the rule of power view, the Security Council should be able to act swiftly when there is a threat to the peace, breach of the peace or act of aggression without losing time to check whether international law is on its side, as was stated by the United States. This would be different when the Security Council was acting in the context of the Pacific settlement of disputes. According to the other view, let's call this the rule of law view, the Security Council should act in accordance with international law, not only in the context of Pacific settlement of disputes, but also when taking enforcement action. There were heated discussions about this in San Francisco. The Egyptian delegate went even so far as to say, and I quote him now, if we want to keep peace and security only, we would not differ much from Hitler, who was also trying to do that and who, as a matter of fact, partly succeeded. But where the difference lies, it that is that we want to maintain peace and security in conformity with the principles of international law and justice. The delegate of the US reacted to this as follows, and I quote him. The distinguished delegate of Egypt made a reference to Hitler. We must not forget that every time that Hitler smashed across the border to trample upon millions of innocent people, he said that he was acting in accordance with international law as he saw it, and justice as he saw it." Unquote. Now, if you now look at the text of Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the Charter, you will see a reference to the principles of justice and international law. But this only relates to the second part of this paragraph dealing with the Pacific Settlement of Disputes. It does not relate to the first part dealing with enforcement action. Egypt proposed an amendment in San Francisco to move up the reference to the principles of justice and international law. As a result, also enforcement measures would need to be in accordance with the principles of justice and international law. When the Egyptian amendment was brought to a vote, there were 21 votes in favor and 21 votes against. Since a two thirds majority was required for the adoption of amendments, it was rejected. So, the rule of power camp won this debate. <clears throat> the emphasis on the need for a strong Security Council able to take swift enforcement action is also demonstrated by the fact that Article 1, Paragraph 1 first refers to enforcement action before mentioning Pacific settlement of disputes. So the opposite order as we see later in the Charter, Chapter 6 and 7. As Kelsen wrote in 1950, mentioning enforcement action first is highly significant. The effective collective measures form the center of the political system, which is at the basis of the Charter, as Kelsen said. The conclusion is that in 1945, the wish to have a strong Security Council with much leeway to take enforcement action prevailed over the wish that such action would have to be in accordance with international law. Now, Let's skip now 25 years, uh, 75 years. And if I now present a picture of the Security Council as it is today, how does the chiaroscuro of rule of power and rule of law look like? As far as the rule of power is concerned, the common determination was in 1945 to have a very strong enforcement body using the strength of the five then superpowers. The most concrete manifestation of the rule of power and the rule of the superpowers is the right of veto. The first question is whether the current P5 members having the right of veto are still the five most powerful countries in the world. Although different answers may be given to this question, in my view, there's little support for the view that nothing has changed in this regard in 75 years. <clears throat> power relations have changed, as has always happened in history. Superpowers come and go. The most obvious difference is that France and the United Kingdom are no longer the huge colonial powers that they were in 1945. Even though they are still important military powers, other countries have become more prominent. 
This is, for example, reflected in the composition of the G7, G8, and the G20. But what matters here is that these changes are not reflected in the Security Council. In my view, it is fair to say that the current P5 are less dominant than they were in 1945. And this brings us to Article 108 of the Charter. In my view, an even bigger problem than the veto is the veto, quote unquote, on veto reform because of the requirement of ratification by each of the permanent members before charter amendments can enter into force. On the one hand, it is logical that the P5 insisted on this in San Francisco. Otherwise, any two-thirds majority of UN members could abolish the veto that was a prerequisite for their participation in the UN. But on the other hand, this is an inherent fundamental flaw in the charter. The drafters of the charter accepted that it was unavoidable to give the right of veto to the most powerful UN members. At the same time, they also knew that power relations change over time. The superpowers after World War I were not the same as the superpowers after World War II. The superpowers in 1945 are not the same as the superpowers now. So the key problem here is that the charter not only provides, pro provides for a legalized uh, hegemony, to use Gary Simpson's expression, but also for a frozen hegemony. The Charter rules freeze the power structures as they existed in 1945. The Charter veto arrangement has often been referred to as realistic, but it is not realistic in the sense that it is not open to changes in power structures. If we now look at the question whether or to what extent the Security Council is governed by the rule of law today, in my view, the answer today must be different from the one given in 1945. Let me give a few brief examples. First example, Security Council has become active in the field of international criminal justice. <clears throat> for example, by establishing the tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and by its role in the establishment of the Lebanon Tribunal. The second example is the story of lack of due process for persons who have been put on financial sanctions list. Only after much criticism, the Security Council established the Ombudsperson. The system is far from perfect, but after some time, the Council made steps in a rule of law direction, at least with respect to the ISIL and Al Qaeda sanctions regime. Third example is UN peacekeeping. Here, the Security Council not only applies the rule of law externally, by often including in the mandate of an operation that it must contribute to the rule of law in the host state. The rule of law is also applied internally. Peacekeeping operations must fully apply the UN human rights due diligence policy adopted in 2011. According to this policy, UN entities, including UN peacekeeping forces, must comply with international humanitarian, human rights and refugee law. 2014, the Security Council held an open debate on the rule of law in peacekeeping operations, resulting in a presidential statement in which these external and internal dimensions of the application of the rule of law are mentioned. A final example are the presidential statements on the rule of law in general. Security Council did not go as far as the General Assembly in 2012 by straightforwardly saying that the rule of law fully applies to the Council and that respect for and the promotion of the rule of law and justice should guide all of its activities and accord predictability and legitimacy to its actions. But its presidential statements refer to its commitment to international law and the Charter of the UN. This was in 2006 and also recently uh, in December 2020, but also to its commitment to ensure that all UN efforts to restore peace and security themselves respect and promote the rule of law. This was in 2010. It's time to draw conclusions. The chiaroscuro in my two pictures of the Security Council, one taken in 1945, the other one now, is different. Both the rule of power and the rule of law are present in both pictures, but the balance between them is different. In 75 years, the situation has changed. Although not necessarily always prevailing, the rule of law is now more present and important in the Council's work. In particular, since the 1990s, it has become more integrated in its work. The Council continues to be dominated by the rule of power, and this has its reason. 
La justice sans la force est impuissante, as Pascal said. But this is now more embedded in the rule of law than in 1945. And this also has its reason. La force sans la justice est tyrannique, the other half of Pascal's observation. Dear colleagues, this is what I wanted to share with you, and I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Blocker. I mean, this is an extraordinary um, overview um, of um, uh, even at the time of the negotiation of the UN Charter and how the tensions and the dilemmas between um, force and power were present uh, from, from the beginning. Um, I, I think that um, it's also very interesting to note uh, how the council has also uh, evolved into having uh, the rule of law more present. Um, I will not um, uh, comment anymore. I wanted now to turn to uh, Professor Dire and um, to zoom um, on a specific issue now um, of uh, this uh, question of uh, the Security Council and the rule of law, which I think it's the particular relationship that uh, the Security Council has also with the um, International Criminal Court and with the questions uh, that were mentioned uh, both by uh, Susanna Vashpato and also just now by Niels Blocker um, of the Security Council also as an actor in terms of promoting um, uh, international criminal justice and the fight against uh, impunity. So, uh, dear, dear, uh, the floor is yours now. You're still muted. Is that, can you, um, thank you very much, uh, Patricia, um, uh, for the introduction. Um, let me just also join uh, Niels um, in thanking um, NUS um, and uh, the Portuguese Foreign Ministry for, for inviting me uh, to speak at this panel. Um, I, I do have a lot of interest in uh, a number of Security Council related issues, so I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be participating. Um, and I'm particularly pleased actually to be speaking after Niels, uh, because I think um, he, he ended perhaps on a, a, a rather uh, optimistic uh, note, um, a slightly more optimistic note um, than I would have ended on. Um, and I'm sure this will come up when we have our a roundtable discussion um, uh, I'm in a bit. Uh, so I'm, needless to say, going to share um, a slightly uh, less optimistic uh, uh, perspective on, um, on the UN Security Council in general, and in particular, the relationship between um, the UN Security Council and, and the International Criminal Court. Uh, there is, of course, um, very much that one can say about the International Criminal Court um, and the UN Security Council, this intersection between the ICC um, and the UN Security Council touches many different issues and aspects um, and can be studied and looked at from many different perspectives and prisms. Um, so, for example, one might question or one might raise the question whether um, the role that, uh, actually I shouldn't even say role, I should say roles, that are attributed to the UN Security Council in the Rome Statute um, in terms of the uh, deferral and referral powers, um, in fact, have the effect of politicizing justice, um, 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 so justice and the rule of law. Um, certainly, uh, arguments have been made by those that, um, that uh, are anti the UN Security Council, uh, are anti the International Criminal Court, in fact, um, that in fact it's just a politicized organ and, and when these arguments are made about how politicized it is, reference is always made to this relationship um, between the UN Security Council um, and the ICC. Um, the very process, in fact the place where I met Niels, um, the very process of um, uh, leading to the adoption of um, an amendment of the Rome Statute and the insertion of the definition of the crime of aggression um, also, of course, implicates this ICC UN Security Council um, relationship. For those of you that uh, that have followed that debate, that have followed the process um, uh, uh, of adopting uh, the amendment to the Rome Statute, you will recall that the single most dominant issue in those debates um, was not so much the definition, but was really about the role that the UN Security Council uh, was to play. 
um, the ICC um, UN Security Council rela uh, relationship, of course, also raises by definition the question of um, the veto, which um, uh, Neil spoke about. Um, and in particular, in this instance, um, its use in relation to what we might call Rome statute crimes or atrocity crimes or whatever the case may be. Um, there is incidentally a very interesting book um, by Jennifer Tran on the subject um, in which uh, uh, it's a recently released uh, uh, Cambridge book um, in which she argues that as things stand as a matter of law, um, there, is, uh, there is a duty uh, on members of the UN Security Council um, not to exercise their veto um, in relation to atrocity crimes. Um, and she uh, advances for this purpose a number of um, arguments, including um, um, Yus Kogan's. I, I, of course, have very different views from her. Um, and it's not because I like the veto, but I think as a matter of law, that's um, uh, that, that view is probably not correct. Um, uh, there was a very interesting Opinio Juris blog symposium on this book, and I'd encourage you um, to have a look at that. Um, so another issue that's also raised is um, in the, uh, at least in the early years of um, the ICC, in, uh, in fact, in particular, the early years of the ICC um, African Union tension, uh, one of the biggest issues that was raised um, was Article 16 and its priori uh, um, um, in its pri propriety, um, the extent to which um, the UN Security Council sort of used this. Um, so, so that's also an issue that that that, that calls for attention. Um, um, all of these issues are simply really different prisms through which the ICC UN Security Council um, the relationship can be uh, addressed. And by the way, one might also say that um, I'm addressing one issue um, very often also raises. Um, um, so one of the other issues, and so for example, the question of aggression, uh, by definition, it'll raise the question of politicization. By definition, it'll raise the question of the use of vetoes, because uh, part of the, the idea of a control or um, of the Security Council having uh, a controlling say of whether or not the, the, the International Criminal Court um, can exercise jurisdiction of, would of course permit um, uh, the permanent members to exercise their veto in order to ensure that their nationals are not prosecuted. Um, instead of discussing all of these, I thought what I would do um, instead is focus on the power of the council to refer situations to the International Criminal Court. Um, I myself do not question um, whether or not this power is appropriate, although others have. So the question has been asked whether or not it's appropriate in the context of the Rome Statute framework um, to permit the, the, um, the International Criminal Court um, to refer situations. Instead, I focus on the limited question of how this power has been used um, and what its effects has been on the landscape um, of international law. Um, and international politics. For me, the starting point for this query um, is actually a situation in which there hasn't been a referral. Um, um, I mean, it's a situation that has been, um, so that was referred to um, in the introductory remarks um, of Susanna, um, and this is the situation in Syria. Um, this is, I think, uh, a wonderful example to sort of look at um, um, the, the, the referral powers of the Security Council and the extent to uh, the manner in which they have been used um, and um, um, so the problems that may arise in these um, referral powers. You, you might remember that at the height of the Syria conflict, there were calls from everywhere that the UN Security Council should refer the situation um, and the atrocities that were committed there um, to the International Criminal Court. Um, Apparently, all of these calls um, were motivated um, by the desire to see justice for victims um, 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 of atrocity crimes. Again, this particular issue, of course, implicates the question of the veto, I mean, the use of the veto, uh, because as we know, because of the veto and in certain instances, the threats of the veto, um, the situation in Syria uh, could not be referred to the um, International Criminal Court. Um, in remarks on behalf of the uh, UN Secretary General, the then UN Secretary General, um, in the 
Deputy Secretary General said that the Security Council, and I want to quote, um, has um, an immense responsibility to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court, and that the failure to do so um, would in fact um, harm the credibility and the legitimacy um, of the um, um, UN Security Council. I want to pause here uh, because I myself took pause and I wondered, um, and eventually, unlike many people, I decided that it was not probably a good idea to make a reference, um, to make a referral, sorry, to the International Criminal Court. My sense, and this was born from the experience of previous referrals, was, and here comes the pessimistic view, that these referrals did not, in fact, lead to justice. And they did not, in fact, lead to justice, probably because they were not motivated um, um, uh, by justice. And so here, I, I, I take a slightly different view from the view that was advanced by Susanna, um, that there have been these instances, and in some instances, motivated by justice, um, 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 so um, the council has acted in a way, um, so either by establishing a tribunal or by referring situations to um, the International Criminal Court. I'm not sure um, that um, the motivation was always justice, and I think this is borne out by um, the responses subsequent to the, um, to the referral. But more than that, I think the referrals, um, and this will probably be the case for future referrals, were really fraught with problems. And so it, it, it's useful perhaps to sort of look at um, uh, the two situations that to date have been referred to this, uh, the International Criminal Court um, by the UN Security Council. Um, in my estimation, my guess is that there isn't likely to be another referral for a very, very, very long time. Um, and I think this might not be a bad thing. So the first one, of course, is um, the situation in Darfur um, in Resolution 1593. Um, and the second one is a situation in Libya, um, Resolution 1970. <clears throat> the cursory glance of these resolutions, which really mirror each other, reveal a couple of things um, which again, tell me that the primary motivation is not justice. And so because the primary motivation is not justice, um, the outcome is unlikely also to be justice. So both resolutions, first of all, I'll start with what I um, think has been the most, um, the most impactful provision um, in the sense of sort of uh, impacting on the landscape of international law um, and international politics. And this is the duty to cooperate. So both resolutions impose a duty to cooperate with the ICC, um, but it does so um, only on the situation country. So the, the resolutions provide that Libya and uh, Sudan um, have a duty to cooperate. Um, it doesn't impose a duty to cooperate um, on any other state. And of course, it's useful to wonder why. Uh, and the answer to that is obvious. Uh, some members uh, of at least some permanent members couldn't countenance the possibility of an obligation on them to cooperate with the court. And so it, since it wouldn't be possible to, to craft the language in a way that imposes obligations on all states except for a few, um, the, the decision that was adopted was simply to impose an obligation on um, the situation countries. Of course, parties to the Rome Statute themselves are under a duty to cooperate, but that is flowing not from the UN Security Council resolution itself, um, but from the Rome Statute. So the UN Security Council resolution simply affirms a duty that's already there. So what's the problem with this, you might ask? Um, in my view, the, 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 so the main problem is that the, the, the tension, um, so the political tension, if you like, um, between the International Criminal Court um, and the African Union arises precisely because of the choices that are made by the Security Council um, in this respect. If you have a UN Security Council resolution that imposes an obligation on all states to cooperate, um, then the whole discussion about immunity, as far as I'm concerned, um, simply um, falls away. Um, by the way, just as an aside, um, in all cases of non-cooperation, uh, thus far, well, not, not all cases, but in many cases of non-cooperation, um, <clears throat> um, the, the, the ICC has referred the non-cooperating states to the Security Council. And I've often wondered, um, even at the time when uh, I served on the Security Council for my country, I often wondered um, 
what the purpose of this is, because after all, there hasn't been a breach of the UN Security Council resolution. There's only been a breach of the Rome Statute itself. So, so that's the first issue, this question of um, cooperation. The second issue um, that one notices when one looks at the um, referring, um, um, referring resolutions is the question of financing. So both resolutions provide that the UN will not be responsible for financing the investigations and or prosecutions that might um, arise from these resolutions. From a political perspective, uh, this certainly suggests that the U UN Security Council is not in its uh, referral motivated by justice in these situations, uh, because if it was motivated by justice well, um, it would make sure that there was financing available um, for successful investigation and prosecution. But that's just a political point. Um, <clears throat> from a legal perspective, it raises for me two questions. Um, so one question is, whether or not this amounts, in fact, to a usurpation of the UN Security Council's, um, sorry, a usurpation by the UN Security Council of the powers of the General Assembly, because under the um, um, UN Charter, um, budgetary matters really fall within the purview of um, the General Assembly. Um, th the second legal issue that I see arising here, when the UN Security Council refers a situation, it does so on behalf of the United Nations as a whole. When the ICC does investigate and it prosecutes um, such or cases arising from such a situation, it also does so on behalf of the UN uh, as a whole. So uh, I think as a legal matter, it does raise the question whether or not uh, members of the UN are on behalf of whom um, these prosecutions and investigations are carried out ought not to be responsible um, financially and should not bear um, um, sort of um, um, the financial burdens for the success. The cooperation and the financing issues are deeply problematic, um, but they're not the most problematic aspect in these referral resolutions. Uh, perhaps the most problematic aspect of the um, referring resolution is the exclusion of jurisdiction over nationals of non-party states where the ICC would in fact have jurisdiction. So in instances where the ICC would have jurisdiction, um, these resolutions have, um, um, so these resolutions have um, excluded um, this jurisdiction. But even more problematic is the exclusion of universal jurisdiction by states over nationals of non-state parties. So um, where a state would ordinarily be entitled to exercise jurisdiction for these atrocity crimes, the price that has been paid for the resolution is that such a state is now no longer permitted to exercise that jurisdiction if it involves a national of a, a non-party state. Um, I mean, I think as far as this particular provision, um, it is, I believe, paragraph six in the um, in resolution 1593. Um, I, I think as far as this particular provision is concerned, the International Criminal Court could, if it were brave enough, um, simply ignore such a provision since um, it itself is not bound by uh, the Charter, nor do I think it's bound by the UN Security Council. Um, so, but I think that's a discussion for another matter. What's not arguable, though, is that UN member states themselves can't ignore it. And so to the extent that there is a resolution, um, a binding resolution, a Chapter 7 resolution, which imposes a duty on states not to exercise jurisdiction that they would ordinarily have, um, 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 UN member states would not be in a position to, to, uh, to ignore that. We all know that um, uh, proponents and champions of the International Criminal Court within the, um, so the UN Security Council um, were not in support of this. Um, this was adopted simply because there was a threat of, of the veto. Um, the reality is that if there were a resolution on Syria, um, the very same framework, the very same template would have to be adopted again because um, um, the permanent members would insist on it or else um, uh, there would be a threat of the veto. So for that reason, I, I, I think that the terrain in which we are moving into, this terrain in which the referral powers of the Security Council are unlikely to be exercised in the future is a good thing, unless there is a change in the modalities where the, the referring resolutions themselves reflect um, um, a desire to achieve justice, 
by ensuring, first of all, that the duty to cooperate um, 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 is a duty that applies universally, that there is a duty on the United Nations to finance these, um, and that there isn't an exclusion of jurisdiction in the manner that we see it um, in these resolutions. And I will stop right here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thierry, for this um, very interesting uh, views. Of course, I mean, it's fair when we discuss about the Security Council to have a more positive or more negative view. That's, uh, I think, uh, uh, part of the game. But I think what you've explained about um, how, in a way, uh, this powerful tool of a Security Council referrals to ICC um, are, are indeed, um, uh, when they're not correctly used, then they they um, end up by defeating the purpose um, of, um, of promoting justice and the fight against impunity and, and the observations that you presented about uh, how in the future, if uh, we have another uh, referral decision, which I'm sure it will not be about Syria, unfortunately, but I think that's a, it's something that we have to be concerned about. Um, but what should be um, as elements of the referral uh, to uh, overcome the, uh, the, the difficulties that you have raised. Uh, but I'm sure we'll come back to some of these points um, in the discussion and also with questions from our audience. So I will turn now to uh, Shamala Thompson. Uh, she has the privilege of being in New York. Actually, she's the only one <laughs> of the group who's in New York. Um, and uh, we appreciate that uh, you had an early morning uh, to join us um, uh, today. And, and um, I, we're very happy that uh, you were able to do so because you um, have day-to-day -day contact uh, with the Security Council work. You're there, you're a direct observer. And so we're very uh, curious and interested in listening to your views on the current uh, issues on the agenda of the Security Council, including, uh, as Nilofer mentioned in the uh, opening remarks, uh, the important issue of climate change, and also um, an interesting issue that it's been in the agenda of the Council, like the protection of civilians, uh, which was something that, uh, for example, Suzanne also mentioned, and it's something that Portugal gave uh, great priority uh, during its uh, term as a non-permanent member. So, uh, Shamala, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I, I'd, I'd say that I would rather be in Singapore or Portugal, but you know, I'm here in New York, um, hopefully one day. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak. And I have to say that I am um, perhaps unfortunately neither a scholar or an international law expert, but I have been watching the Security Council, I guess for the last 15 years now, I, I started the Security Council report in 2006. And um, I have seen um, Susanna, for example, um, you know, when Portugal was on the council, um, South Africa three times now. But what I would like to, to look at, and um, I have a PowerPoint that I'll share in a second, is um, the way thematic issues have come into the council and evolved at using um, the lens of the protection of civilians and the more recent climate and security issue. And through that, I think we can see some of the more um, interesting changes and different dynamics that are in play today and the challenges that I think are faced in addressing some of these issues, particularly in the last few years. So I will now um, try and share this. So um, I will not go into detail here. We've already heard about the UN Charter and um, basically the primary role of the Security Council is the maintenance of international peace and security. And these thematic issues that I'm going to talk about have been deemed as an issue that is relevant under Article 24, but also in relation to Article 37 and um, the idea of what is a threat to international peace and security. And we have seen over the years an expansion of the idea of what is a threat. I mean, today it's quite, you know, uh, threats are considered um, non-proliferation, for example, terrorism, compared to the early days of the council when it was much more a, a conflict across borders. It has expanded. Um, and we've seen the acceptance of, of many of these thematic issues over the years, starting in the late 1990s. And the protection of civilians um, 
was one of the first thematic issues um, together with children and armed conflict and women's peace and security that came into the council's agenda around that time. The first meeting was in February 1999. They adopted a presidential statement at that meeting and a resolution, um, an important resolution 1265 later in the year, in that same year, which laid the foundations for what we saw um, for the um, consideration of protection of civilians in the Security Council. And over the last 20 odd years, there have been more than 100 thematic issues which have a protection of civilians component in it um, of some sort. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the aspects of how this issue has evolved. But um, you know, one, one thing we have seen over the years is that elected members have been particularly active in creating this culture of protection of civilians. Canada um, was the, the member that um, held that first meeting in 1999. And since then, we've seen Australia, Egypt, Japan, you know, a list of elected members, including Portugal, who have come into the council with protection of civilians as a high priority and help to expand the understanding and entrench protection of civilians as very much an issue that um, is, is um, critical to the council's consideration of its country specific items as well. Sorry. Um, in terms of objectives, I won't go into detail here, but I think there's a familiarity with sort of um, what protection of civilians um, means in the council and, you know, it's the compliance with international law, um, facilitating humanitarian access. Um, it, uh, you, it looks at the idea of displaced persons, um, protection through UN peace operations and the idea of, of responding to violations and the promotion of accountability. Um, in terms of current practices in the Council, thematic um, ish, uh, protection of civilian reports come out once a year, usually in May. Um, the Council then will have a debate around the report and usually a second debate at some point in the year. It can be more than two if elected members choose to highlight other protection of civilian aspects of protection of civilians. Um, there's also information coming in from the Secretary General's reports on country specific situations. And this is very important in sort of how um, the issue has become entrenched. Looking at the first decade, um, I'd say that there was a strengthening of the normative framework and this created the uh, POC ecosystem. We saw that the Council was able to adopt five thematic resolutions on the overall issue of protection of civilians and seven presidential statements. And all this created really the, the type of um, uh, practice and um, a way in which the Council can address this issue. We also began to see, you know, in a parallel development, issues like children in armed conflict, um, WPS, small arms and light weapons, coming in and they sit sort of under sort of an umbrella of protection of civilians where they are separate but interconnected um, and are also very actively discussed by, by the council. The um, integration of POC issues into country situations um, through the peacekeeping mandates was also very much part of the development in the first 10 years. In the second decade, if you look at 2009 to 2019 or to today in, in many ways, it was a, what was happening was the um, POC framework, the normative framework was being translated to work on the ground. Um, we saw streamlining into country specific resolutions, which was very important in being able to move from the idea of the normative framework to the practice. And, um, and we also saw more tools being developed, for example, with children in armed conflict as a monitoring and reporting mechanism that is very much part of the infrastructure, collects information on violations against children. And these type of tools were critical in being able to address POC in a concrete manner um, and not just sort of through a thematic um, discussion. The dedicated thematic um, resolutions started to emerge during this period. Um, in 2014, we saw a resolution on um, UN humanitarian personnel in relation to protection of civilians, protection of journalists um, in conflict um, came right after that, medical, uh, protection of medical care in armed conflict, 
in 2016, hunger and conflict in 2018, persons with disabilities and missing persons in 2019. So we see an increase of these subdivisions in some ways um, within protection of civilians. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in terms when I come to some of the issues that we're seeing with this. Um, I won't go into detail with um, the idea of POC and peacekeeping. There's been a lot written about it. It is sort of one of the ways in which protection of civilians is being you know, very much um, the lens in which it's looked at. Um, we, we saw that right after the first discussion on protection of civilians in the council, the uh, mission that was set up in um, Eunice Mill in 1999 had a POC mandated, um, was, was, had a POC mandate. Um, every peacekeeping mission since 2003 has had some type of protection of civilians mandate. Um, and seven of the 13 current peacekeeping missions have this. We've also seen an evolution of, of what it means to have POC in a mission as the nature of peacekeeping has changed. And there have been issues. I mean, we saw, you know, sort of issues in South Sudan where the peacekeepers, you know, were were seen to have not been able to protect civilians and what was, you know, sort of then um, a study was done to look at what was needed there. So there are issues around how it is carried out, even though there may be stronger mandates um, and, and more, um, you know, developed mandates around POC in peacekeeping. A quick look at a couple of the tools that are there for POC in the Council. There's a aid memoir that is regularly uh, is updated periodically. Um, the last one was 2015, I believe, the one that's existing now. And this is a reference tool that helps the Council um, in looking at protection of civilians. Uh, and it includes language that can be used in country-specific situations, particularly in peacekeeping mandates. Um, this has helped in the mainstreaming of the issue of protection of civilians. It's um, a very long document, um, but I think it has been useful um, as council members sort of look at renewals of mandates. The other important um, institutional sort of development was the informal expert group on protection of civilians, which was created in 2009 um, by the UK, and they chair this um, informal expert group. So it is not a formal body of the um, Security Council. It is, um, so it's not a formal substory body, but it is one that, um, and, and not all 15 members need to attend the meetings, but what is interesting in the early days is that China and Russia often did not attend this meeting of the informal expert group, but they have started to do so more and more. Um, and it has been, I think, very important in helping to mainstream the language because they meet ahead of a mandate renewal um, 10 to 12 times a year um, is, is, is how often they meet. And they discuss um, sort of the language in the last resolution that renewed the a peacekeeping mission and you know what they'd like, what they, how they think it can be strengthened, what they think is, is missing. And these discussions have led to stronger um, language in, in these mandates um, for peacekeeping missions. The um, Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, um, has led in this group. They, they have provided the briefings. What is interesting in the evolution of this group as well is that it has expanded beyond just OCHA briefing to having other parts of the UN also participating and being there for questions. But more and more, they are getting briefings from the, the field. So they hear from those who are trying to implement the um, POC aspects in a peacekeeping mandate, which is, I think, very useful in, as the council um, sort of drafts or, or negotiates these mandates. Um, so coming to some of the challenges um, we see in protection of civilians, um, there have been a number of challenges that have continued over the years. And um, the first would be the gap between the theoretical and practical protection. So the normative you know, framework is in place, but the implementation is, is not always easy. Um, and, and a lot of that is up to member states to, to so prioritize POC and ensure that um, what is needed to, to carry out what the council is asking for is indeed you know, present. Um, the implementation of the mandates, you know, the, the language can be there in a council resolution, but if there isn't um, sort of 
the, the mission has not been able to get the resources or um, the, the type of training they need to implement, this is a problem. Um, there is, I think, greater guidance, especially for peacekeepers than there, there has um, than in the early years, but I think this can be increased and it's a continuous sort of thing. Um, respect for international law, we see that this, um, and I'll talk about this a bit more, that is, I think, it is more and more difficult to sort of make sure that there is adherence to international humanitarian law, human rights law. We see a bit of a pushback with some of that, but also the accountability um, for serious violations. We have situations on the council today where there, there are clear violations. Um, you know, Syria was mentioned and that there's a good example there, but we also have Myanmar right now where it's very difficult to talk about accountability um, for, for the type of violations that um, took place in 2017 with the Rohingya refugee crisis, but also um, today with what's happening in, in Myanmar. And um, sanctions regimes now include criteria related to protection of civilians, including violations against children, human rights. Um, but the implementation of sanctions regimes is an issue that you know continues to to sometimes be quite difficult um, in particular certain situations. On top of this, we have new challenges: the fragmentation of um, the agenda that I mentioned, where we have these new subdivisions coming in. Although the expansion is good as an overall thing for protection of civilians, I think that there have been, there are views that this fragmentation may mean that maybe more attention will be paid to one aspect of protection of civilians um, and others could be neglected, resources put into one. But it has come about because members have felt that it's important to highlight something that hasn't been discussed um, so widely in the council and, and some of them like hunger and security, I think we see this in several situations and you know it, it is now something that's regularly discussed in the council. Um, there have been briefings say, on Yemen and South Sudan related to famine because this issue came into the council and um, they asked for the Secretary General to brief if needed on, on situations like that. But there are others that become sort of much a little bit more narrowly focused, whether it's missing persons or um, persons with disabilities. They are important protection of civilians issues, but may come up more re less regularly and more as thematic issues. The attacks on um, healthcare is a important, I think, issue that when it came up um, and a resolution was adopted in 2016, um, and elected members were the ones that brought this to the council, a group of elected members, I think it was seen as particularly important at a time where you had Syria and Yemen, um, situations like Syria and Yemen, South Sudan as well, where there were sort of clear issues around attacks on, on um, healthcare workers and hospitals. We have seen in the last five years that the implementation hasn't been as good as has been hoped for. And I've heard that the annual report on protection of civilians this year that will be one of the focus um, of that report where they're trying to, I think, show that there is a need to you know, sort of uh, refocus on this because having that resolution hasn't necessarily led to um, enough action on the ground. Um, there are other new uh, issues that are coming in such as urban warfare, counterterrorism, and sort of what that means for civilians, um, climate change and environment, which I'm gonna talk about um, in need very soon. Um, things like weapons technology, which is really drones and how that is, um, the use of that in, and how it affects civilians and transitions in peacekeeping missions. I think that is going to come up more in relation to how during um, a transition from a peacekeeping mission to a political mission or um, a mission closing down, how, you know, which parts of the UN will take over the POC functions. And a lot of that is not that clear still. So looking at climate change, um, this is a much newer issue you think in the council, but really um, it has been um, discussed in some form since 2007, but you'll see there hasn't been easy. If you look between 2007 and 2020, there have only been five sort of overall thematic dis discussions on climate and change, so climate and security. And this is because it's not an issue that um, some of the permanent members particularly, but also elected members at times have felt should be discussed in the council. I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, but because it's been difficult, one way in which it's come into the council is through sort of 
other types of uh, discussions around, related to climate and security, but in more specific situations, for example, in the Sahel or water um, peace and security. That seems to have been a little bit more acceptable than talking about it as a larger thematic issue, um, because you can connect it to um, a security issue in that region or in that specific um, um, country. Um, we have seen the other way in which it's been discussed by the Council is through ARIA formula meetings, which are informal meetings of the Council. So all, again, all 15 don't have to attend, but it does allow Council members to highlight an issue that perhaps is difficult um, to discuss in the Council, but deserves the Council's attention. They can bring in briefers on specific topics related to climate, and you'll see that over the years, a range of um, countries, elected members, and some permanent members have hosted these type of meetings. We have seen in the last, um, since 2018, so last three years or so, three or four years, um, there is a, a development, I think, um, developments in the council related to the um, institutions um, where on climate and security that I think are a sign that it is becoming slightly more acceptable or something that's moving towards it. We're not at the level of the um, ecosystem um, that the POC has or the infrastructure of children and armed conflict in the council, but very slowly the steps are being taken. And the first one would be this group of friends in 2018 with Germany and Nauru um, co-founded and our coaches. Although it's not just council members, you see that there are 10 council members that are part of this group of friends. They, they have been meeting regularly and discussing sort of um, issues related to the security effects of climate change, um, trying to increase public awareness and strengthen the UN system. Um, this is all at the same time, they, um, a, the security, climate security mechanism was created um, and it is a body within the secretary. It's very small, um, three or four people at the moment, I think. But um, the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, UNDP and the UN Environment Agency, um, they each have representatives on it. And the idea is um, they are providing guidance. Um, you know, they have documents that they have shared to help the system, um, the UN system, um, develop some sort of shared language and an approach to this issue. It's very early stages, not just for the Security Council, but for the entire UN system and how to address, um, you know, sort of climate and security. And we have seen already that they have been working with um, the UN regional offices, um, including um, the, the office in West Africa and Central Africa to, to um, on projects related to um, climate. And this is something um, where there's reporting to the council by these two UN officers. So it's one way in which the issue can come into the council and give the council information on what's happening regionally. Um, the most recent development was um, last year, which was a very difficult year in some ways, um, or the last two years for climate and security because of the dynamics in the council, with the US particularly not being keen to have it discussed, Russia and China traditionally, have had issues um, discussing climate security, but they were joined by the US in the last few years, last four years. And um, although it was um, difficult to get certain outcomes like a resolution, um, by the end of last year, um, the council members who were interested in this issue were able to form a informal group of members, um, of council members on security and climate. And, um, Niger and Germany were the co-chairs for um, part of last year when it started. It was announced in July, a debate on climate and security. And then um, this year, Ireland and Niger are the co-chairs. And I have to say that um, a good sign, I think, is that there was competition to be the co-chair. Ireland is the co-chair, but there were other elected members who were very interested, um, which tells you, you know, something about members coming in with um, climate and security as a priority while they're on the council. Um, and, th and they have met twice um, on Somalia at the end of last year and on the Sahel um, earlier this year. Interestingly, China and Russia have attended as observers. They, they said, we are not part of this group, but we will attend. And I think that's a sign that 
they know it cannot be uh, completely ignored as an issue on the council. What we have seen, I feel, is a momentum with more and more elected members coming in, being very interested in the issue and not wanting and, and wanting to take it up in some way. And right now, I feel there are 10, um, no, nine out of the 10 elected members, I'd say, are very interested. There's one who is not so sure, but they, I don't think they will oppose it. Um, and we have three permanent members who are very supportive. Um, Russia and China, Russia is still quite um, resistant China that we see slight softening. So there's some hope among members who really would like to have this discussed and possibly have a resolution this year that perhaps this is the, the time, the momentum is there and it is the time to, to try and develop this issue, see some progress in terms of what the council can do. Um, I want to just highlight very quickly the um, way in which there has been some mainstreaming of language and this started in 2017 when the council went on a visiting mission to the Lake Chad Basin, where at the time they met with um, the leaders in Nigeria and Niger, and they heard from them the impact of the, um, the drying up of Lake, the Lake Chad Basin and the rise of Boko Haram, the, the direct link. And I, we know that you know, in talking to council members when they came back, that really did have an impact because it led to a resolution on the Lake Chad Basin and Boko Haram and you'll see on my slide that it included language really for the first time that you know sort of talked about the adverse effect of climate change on the stability of, of that part uh, of that region. And the language on the need for risk assessment and risk management strategies, we then saw being included in several other African issues, which I've listed there. Um, it has not been included in non-African issues. Um, they have tried, for example, with Haiti, um, but found a great deal of resistance. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, um, but there has been some level of inclusion of climate and security language has started. Um, it is a little more difficult than it was um, in 2017, 2018 in the last two years. And, you know, I, I don't see a huge change yet, but we'll, we'll see where it goes. And they have been able to get um, some of this type of language in a few thematic um, resolutions, including uh, women, peace and security and counterterrorism. Um, I've touched a little bit on the dynamics and I'm going to end here very soon, but the idea of, you know, the difficult dynamics is still there, but I think there's a increasing sort of interest that I, we see, and I think it will be interesting to watch over the year what happens as elected members try to take this up. Um, there is more difficulty in the last years in the integration of this language. There has been um, negotiations that have um, you know, been very difficult, even on country specific issues where this is not the core um, issue, but it has made a negotiation difficult. For example, as I mentioned on Haiti, um, and the other issue, I think, is that there is no institutional home, really. Um, there is this climate security mechanism, there's UNEP, but I think there needs to be that development of an infrastructure, which, and, and it's not just the Security Council, I think they have a role to play, but there are other parts of the UN that also need to, to work together with the Council on this. Um, so I, I think we've seen sort of how long it can take for an issue to get entrenched in the work of the council. But um, there are times where there's more resistance, I think, to a new issue coming in. And we have seen that a bit with climate and security. But um, I think members haven't given up and they have kept working on ways of bringing it in to, to have these discussions because I think they feel it is very important. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've heard a little bit already about you know, sort of um, why it is something that the council should look at. So I, I will stop here. Um, I think I will stop and see if um, we can end. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Shamala, for this very informative presentation of somebody who follows really the activities of the council um, very closely and on these uh, two thematic uh, topics we tend to focus on the Security Council uh, in relation to regional issues or country-specific issues, but I think this uh, activities in terms of a thematic 
issues is also very important. One more classical, more traditional, which has been uh, perhaps easily um, more easily accepted, which is the protection of uh, civilians. But I think it's um, unavoidable also. And what you say about um, uh, non-permanent elected members that come into the council and they want to bring the issue up. And, and recently there's been also an informal um, interactive discussion of the Security Council also on climate and security. And we saw, I mean, that the interest um, of uh, the Security Council also uh, discussing this uh, these issues. Um, so without uh, delaying any more uh, the conversation, I wanted to pass immediately the floor to Professor Anthony Angie, who will uh, bring us uh, his reflections on the Security Council uh, from a 12 perspective, and we look forward yeah. to listening to you. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia, and uh, let me thank the uh, co-organizers of this event, uh, and especially in this context, um, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Portugal. Uh, let me also thank my co-panelists for their very informative and detailed presentations, uh, which uh, lead me to think that they are in the best position to answer the questions which have been uh, presented in the chat. So I'll leave all those questions to my expert co-panelists, <laughs> because uh, my approach is going to be uh, somewhat different uh, in this context. Uh, so when I was invited uh, to give this presentation, I felt it was very brave of Patricia uh, to actually invite me to talk about this peculiar thing called twail. I mean, what, whatever that is. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the most uh, of our uh, viewers and listeners would be very puzzled as to what this thing is, this peculiar species called uh, twail. Uh, so I thought I would begin just by saying a few things about twail and then uh, suggesting ways in which uh, TWAIL might help us in illuminating certain aspects of the Security Council and its operations. Um, so um, let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, so I guess the first question would be something like, okay. Uh, uh, what is TWAIL? Um, so for those, uh, the majority of you who would not have heard of this, uh, TWAIL is, uh, you could say, a network of scholars, uh, and we call ourselves Third World Approaches to International Law. And the basic question we ask is, how can international law be used to further the interests of the peoples of the Third World? Uh, so it has always been the ambition of uh, states that were previously colonized to be able to actually use the tools of international law with all the promise of international law to actually advance the interests of the people of the Third World. But the answer to this question or this whole process is not a particularly easy process, because if you look at this whole situation historically, we do understand that historically, at least, international law has been used to actually suppress the people of the third world, the people of the non-European world. And uh, this took the form of imperialism and international law was entirely complicit uh, and supportive of the whole project of imperialism. So then the, the, the question is, how can we use international law, which has been uh, a, a mechanism of imperialism against imperialism and in favor of the people that it had previously suppressed. So that is the, the basic question. And many generations of scholars from non-European countries have addressed this, as well as, uh, I should say, very distinguished scholars from the West as well, who have been supportive of this movement. Um, so one of the, uh, uh, you could say, one of the strategies that Twail scholars use is to uh, contest and think about alternative histories of international law in order to develop an alternative set of analytical tools. So the claim here would be that international law, we think about international law, even if we don't uh, recognize this, we think about international law in a way that is shaped by our understanding of the history of international law. And the history of international law generates the lenses, the analytical tools by which we view the discipline. And the, the twail claim would be that uh, we need a different set of analytical tools if we are to understand the, you could say, the complex relationship between international law and the non-European world. Because most of the history of international law focuses on a certain set of analy analytical tools and a certain set of problems. So for example, uh, the classic problem of international law is the problem of equal and sovereign states. You know, how can law be established in a situation where um, uh, we have uh, equal and sovereign states uh, uh, competing for power 
and uh, doing so in the absence of an overarching sovereign. That is the classic problem of international law that many of the best minds in our discipline have attempted to address. So we could see this problem as, in a way, arising from that fundamental defining event, the, the Peace of Westphalia, which of course we're all familiar with, no matter where we come from in different parts of the world. But our claim would be, the trail claim would be, international law is not only about this problem about equal and sovereign states. Our claim would be that international law is also about developing a set of legal technologies for managing and exploiting the non-European world. And it is usually the case historically that the non-European world has been characterized as barbaric and violent. And as a result of this, it is the non-European world that in fact generates the technologies that international law formulates in order to accomplish this mission, the mission that we might call the civilizing mission. And so that's uh, how, we're, how we come to the claim that uh, international legal doctrines, including the fundamental doctrine of sovereignty, has been used for this purpose. So we can see sovereignty doctrine seen as a, you know, as a uh, creation of the West. We can see that now in the traditional history of international law, the argument is sovereignty was created in the West by the Treaty of Westphalia or the Peace of Westphalia. And then it was benevolent, benevolently extended to the non-European world. Twale scholars would ask a different question. Twale scholars would ask the question of how was it decided that the non-European world was lacking in sovereignty? And so if we see sovereignty doctrine in that regard, we can see that sovereignty is not only about this benevolent project of civilization and inclusion, but sovereignty is about excluding certain people from the realm of sovereignty, declaring them to be non-sovereign. And once they are non-sovereign, of course, then international law or the West is in a position to actually occupy those peoples and their lands and develop legal technologies in order to do so. Because the problem of equal and sovereign states is entirely inapplicable to the non-European world and to the history of the non-European world. So I hope uh, we can see then how if we adopt a different set of questions and a different analytical lens, we might see the history of international law in a different way. So then my next point here is the basic structure of imperial rule. The basic structure of imperial rule is the imperial powers are immune to law. They are beyond the law, but they adhere very much to the philosophy or to the ideology of the rule of law. In other words, there is this duality. We are beyond the law, but we establish the rule of law and we enforce the rule of law for the backward, violent, non-European people. And it is in this regard that race becomes fundamentally important because race in the 19th century was the basic and fundamental way in which non-European states were de declared uncivilized. If you belong to an inferior race, you were uncivilized. If you were uncivilized, then you were lacking in sovereignty. If you were lacking in sovereignty, then you had no legal standing to participate in the international system or to legally oppose in any way the various forms of violence that were inflicted on you. So these are some of the analytical tools that Twail has been developing in order to rethink the history of international law, in order to provide a better sense of how you could say, uh, we can understand the history of non-European people and their relationship to international law. Now, let me also say, of course, that uh, in talking about non-European people, I'm talking about most of the world. So it seems utterly scandalous to us, to me, that the conventional history of international law, which is based on this Western idea of international law, has been somehow propagated to the non-European world itself as being the authentic universal history of international law. This is nonsense. And queer scholars are developing the arguments to demonstrate why it is nonsense. Um, and so then the, uh, the further project is what alternatives can we come up with? Uh, uh, is there a different way of thinking about international law based on this history, based on rethinking this history and based on recovering lost voices? So in this case, the concern is how do we recover and engage with the suppressed voices of the peoples of the third world? So that is, you could say, the further theme that is very important to trail. Now, this is just a very crude summary of some of the basic Twail uh, concerns and themes, but I hope it will do for uh, our purposes because I think I've got like uh, eight minutes left to actually now apply this uh, this uh, this uh, this set 
to or this set of ideas to the Security Council. So let's think about the history of international law and the history of international institutions. I would suggest that a classic history of international institutions would again be, begin with the Peace of Westphalia. If we look at Leo Gross, Leo Gross wrote a very influential article about the Peace of Westphalia, tracing directly the line from the Peace of Westphalia to the United Nations via the League, the League of Nations. And we can also think about the Congress of Vienna. And here we see the fundamental problem that is raised in each of these cases is the problem of powerful states. How can powerful states be integrated into the system of international law? This is precisely the problem that Professor Blocker was so articulate in presenting. You know, the powerful states want to retain their power, and yet they have to be given some place in any kind of universal institution that is going to govern the world. I would say that we might think about a different history, a different background to the United Nations. And that history I want to suggest is the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. So let's think of this as being the beginning point of international institutions. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details of the Berlin Conference of 1884-85, but I think many of us are aware of the fact that it divided up Africa in the end. And uh, that's why we have you know, the map of Africa that is presented here. And all the European states, the major European states, uh, plus I think Turkey, I think Turkey was present. They all gathered in Berlin, had this large map of Africa on the wall and divided up Africa among them. So can we see that certain fundamental themes emerged? And again, I'm summarizing. The basic idea of the Berlin Conference was how do we establish peace among ourselves, among the great powers? We don't want to get in, you know, the 19th century is seen as the century of great peace in Europe. It might have been the great peace in Europe, but it was precisely the century of massive exploitation and imperial wars and conquest. So can we see the, the, the difference? Peace in Europe, war in the non-European world. But the Berlin Conference said, we don't want to create a war in Europe as a result of imperial frictions and rivalries. So that's what the the, the, uh, the Berlin Conference was aimed at doing. So can we see again, great powers trying to organize peace among themselves, but saying, let's fight it out in the non-European world. And let's organize a way in which we can coordinate in our exploitation of the non-European world. Now, the language in which this was done was invariably humanitarian. If we look, again, I don't have time to go into the provisions of the Berlin Conference, but it was all about the abolition of the slave trade. We need to go into Africa in order to prevent those tyrants, those barbaric people from doing these terrible things to each other. So there was a very powerful humanitarian in, uh, impulse in the Berlin Conference. The whole idea of the Berlin Conference, it's a free trade agreement. So, con so connected with all this is the idea of how do we exploit the riches of Africa while being humanitarian? And then a very powerful idea of the, something like the rule of law. The natives are lacking in law and order. We need to establish law and order among them. And then finally, um, it was also very interesting in terms of the, uh, just in terms of international institutions, in terms of establishing a commission to manage the navigation uh, of, uh, of the Congo River, you know, this immense river. How do we manage relations among countries in the midst of all this? Well, unfortunately, uh, this grand scheme did not work out particularly well. The slave trade was abolished, but most of the violence that was taking place in Africa at this time, or at least a good proportion of it was inflicted by European powers. I think most of you by now would be familiar with the fact that as a result of King Leopold's rule over the Congo, something like five to 10 million Africans were died as a result of the exploitation of the Congo by King Leopold. In, in effect, it was something like the Holocaust that was taking place in Africa. And all this under the auspices of the noble sentiment of the Berlin, the, the Berlin Conference and these international institutions. Okay, so um, then I come to, I'm switching now to the Bandung Conference of 1955. This is the first moment really where peoples of Africa and Asia meet on a historical occasion to actually consider how they might contribute in this decolonized world to the making of international law. 
And so what were their concerns and how did they view the United Nations? Now, it should be said, as Professor Blocker pointed out, uh, that there were many non-European states present uh, at the drafting of uh, the, uh, they were present at uh, San Francisco. But again, as Professor Blocker pointed out, they were, they were caught up with this whole idea of power. In other words, it seemed inescapable that the great powers must be given special privileges if they are to be part of the system. But it's very interesting that even then, for example, the Egyptian delegate said something like, well, the effect of the veto is going to be that the French bombing of Syria, the French bombed Syria in 1925. It was a famous incident which caused a lot of discussion and controversy among international humanitarian lawyers of the time. And there's a whole interesting discussion about whether, whether it is acceptable to bomb natives, the uncivilized people, without any restriction because they don't observe the laws of war. There's a wonderful discussion about this in the American Journal of International Law. But the Egyptian delegate said, well, the, the effect of the veto means that your violence, the violence of the great powers who exercise a veto will not be subject to scrutiny of the Security Council. So that was seen right there in 1945 in San Francisco. What were the concerns of Bandung? So Bandung was very much concerned to actually complement what the United Nations was doing. But at the same time, they felt somewhat excluded from the United Nations. It's very interesting, isn't it? You know, India was present, but Nehru, the greatest statesman and politician of India, could not be present at San Francisco because he, he was put into jail by the British. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but by 1955, at the time of Bandung, already it was clear that the United Nations could not deal with the major conflicts that were taking place. And in Bandung, of course, they were thinking, for example, about the French in Indochina. So all these wars were taking place. All these wars were powerfully connected with the great powers trying to maintain their colonial privileges, among other things. But none of those wars could fall within the scope of what the Security Council was doing. So all the violence that was inflicted by the great powers was outside the realm of the scrutiny of the Security Council as a result of the veto. So if we look at, for example, all the violence inflicted on, you know, well, the Vietnam War, was there a single Security Council resolution passed or decision made on the, on the Vietnam War? I couldn't find one. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, corrected by any of you about whether there was any decision. So let's take the Vietnam War. You know, Laos was bombed to a greater extent than Germany was bombed in the, in the Second World War. Laos was bombed by the United States to a greater extent than Germany was bombed in the Second World War. Laos was not even at war. And that was something that was, could not be subjected to Security Council scrutiny. So the other concern was, so the, so the Bandung conference said, we need to think of an alternative system because already within 10 years of the creation of the Security Council, as far as the Bandung states were concerned, the United Nations could not directly address the violence that was taking place. <laughs> then the further concern of these countries was disarmament. Because if you look at, you know, uh, the, greatest, the greatest fear of statesmen at this time, and surely this was the whole point of Hiroshima, was the, of, was nuclear, was the uh, nuclear proliferation. Again, I don't have time to read the statements made by people, by the statesmen at Bandung. You know, Romulo and uh, uh, Kotalavala from Sri Lanka, what they had to say about all this. But the huge concern was, if we are going to achieve peace, we need to achieve disarmament. So I would like to ask all my colleagues about what the Security Council has done about disarmament, because all of you are experts on this. What has the Security Council done about disarmament in a situation where we have escalating disarmament of nuclear weaponry that can destroy the world thousands of times? What has the Security Council focused on? Weapons of mass destruction, certainly an important issue. But isn't it interesting that you know, it should be that type of weaponry that has been focused on 
And the Security Council, in fact, if you look at Resolution 1540, I think it is, the Security Council has said, well, we need to be concerned about weapons of mass destruction, and uh, we need to be concerned about chemical weapons. And of course, these are very important issues. But in the meantime, they are, and in fact, the Security Council asks other states to adhere to the non-proliferation treaty, whereas the Security Council members themselves have been entirely, you could say, resistant to the application of that treaty to their own operations. And we can see this also in the case that went before the ICJ and the role of the Security Council states in preventing the ICJ from assuming jurisdiction over that case. Okay, so um, anti-democratic character of the United Nations, that was obvious right from the beginning. So here I'm, I'm simply saying these were the concerns of the third world back in 1955. And I really wonder how far those concerns have been addressed in any meaningful way, uh, seven, you know, all these years later, 65 years later. So let me then just, uh, my final slide, uh, you know, uh, going back to what I mentioned, it's really interesting that the Security Council, most of its action or most of its focus is on Africa. Just as, so this goes back to the 12 point. International law is made in the non-European world because that world is seen as savage, barbaric, backward and in need of rescue, just like the Berlin Conference sought to rescue the people of Africa. And so it's in the, it's in the non-European world that all these new technologies, all these new techniques are developed by the Security Council. Um, so now I'm not, I'm not saying that everything the Security Council does is bad. You know, I think uh, Shamala pointed out some really important initiatives that are being taken, that, that are being taken. But I would simply point out that there is a structural bias in the way in which violence is understood. Violence is understood as taking place in the non-European world. It is not understood as originating among the great powers themselves. So how do we deal with that structural imbalance? Disarmament, as I said, the Security Council has done, the Security Council members have done really very little in terms of disarmament while calling everybody else to disarm. And I would say the structure of imperial rule remains. In other words, the structure of imperial rule is we are above the law, but we create the rule of law for you. Now, uh, Professor Blocker made a very uh, resonant argument in terms of the rule of law now gradually infiltrating into the Security Council. I would simply say, think about the sanctions on Iraq. Think of the children who died as a result of the sanctions on Iraq. How is that going to be reviewed? All right, let's say the Lancet, I think the Lancet said that 500,000 children died as a result of those sanctions. Let's say that's wrong. Let's say it's only 50,000, or only 10,000. Should that not be reviewed? So this goes to complex issues that the Lockerbie case raises. Uh, so you know, I think uh, uh, I would complement uh, what uh, uh, the discussion earlier uh, with the Lockerbie case, and we have to discuss th that set of issues. Um, and also uh, Dere's uh, discussion about you know, the Security Council and its role in the ICC and how that might be used in, to actually provide certain immunities to Security Council members. So, um, so what I'm uh, really saying is, um, you know, we think of the Security Council as being dealing with the problem of a threat to peace and security. The question I would ask is, is it possible that the Security Council itself is a threat to peace and security? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Engi, for this very thought-provoking intervention. Um, I knew that um, uh, this was coming from you and uh, I think it's excellent uh, uh, that then, and I feel that what this panel brought is different views, complementary views, different ways of thinking about this fundamental institution that uh, uh, we all want um, to um, be able to uh, take up its um, full role um, as um, uh, the main uh, keeper of international peace and security, and also at the same time as an instrument of the rule of law. I think that's uh, uh, the uh, main uh, main point that we're trying to discuss and what have been the achievements, what are the failures and, and what could be could be improved. Um, I'm now faced with the dilemma because the presentations were so interesting and so rich 
And we have um, a number of questions in, in the chat box, in the Q&A box, um, that I'm tempted to um, use my moderated privileges to try to compact um, uh, some of the questions um, into one, which I think it's really the fundamental uh, question. And since we only have uh, about 10 minutes um, to wrap up and without wanting to abuse the um, our hosts, our Singaporean hosts that are late in the evening already, uh, perhaps I'll do that. I mean, there are some specific questions related to sanctions, IHL, non-state actors, immunities, uh, but there are also a couple of questions that I think uh, deal with the, uh, the fundamental issues issue that uh, I think um, all of you alluded in your interventions. And it's always a bit the elephant in the room, which is the question of the Security Council reform. And I would propose that we would just have one question uh, dealing with that, and especially taking into account that in the 75th uh, declaration um, that uh, was adopted in the commemoration um, of this anniversary of the UN, member states again committed uh, to instill new life, and I'm reading from the declaration, instilling new life in the discussions on the reform of the Security Council. Um, so more, um, now that we've looked a lot to the past um, and, and we see a bit what are the difficulties and what could be uh, the improvements, um, I wanted to ask all the panelists and, and feel free to take the uh, floor in the order that, uh, that you wish. Um, what are your views with regard to the question of the reform um, in terms of the enlargement and in terms of the veto power, including on the initiatives that are on the table regarding the, the, the veto power? So it's a very broad question, very difficult uh, to uh, answer just in a couple of minutes, but I think that's what we can do with the time that we have available. So I would just uh, uh, give uh, about two minutes uh, for each of the um, speakers um, to give uh, our, um, uh, their views on, on this big issue of the uh, reform, um, both on the question of the enlargement and, and on the veto. Uh, so whoever wants to take the floor first, uh, you're very welcome. Okay, so, Niels. so I'll... Ah, sorry, I think we have a tie. <laughs> we'll go with Niels and then Deere. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thanks also to the other panelists. Uh, and Patricia, this is really the question I was thinking about uh, because it seems to be the underlying theme. Um, uh, and well, elephant in the room, I think we all know that this is, is crucial, it's urgent. And so I, I completely agree that this is what we have to discuss in our final few minutes. Um, my own idea is that this, uh, that it's really a matter of um, trying to find the right circumstances and it's a combination of institutions and the right people at the right moment to bring, to create some momentum like we had it in 2004 and 2005. This was after the Iraq crisis, uh, Kofi Annan picking this up, the high level panel, and this was the stepping stones towards the resolution 2005. And then unfortunately the issue of UN Security Council reform was not able to, to, to it could not be achieved, but this is urgent. And my feeling was listening to the presentations by my colleagues, this is very much underlying some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, it relates to the thematic issues, protection of civilians, climate change, a number of problems that were mentioned. I uh, wonder, and uh, perhaps, well, I think that um, after a Security Council reform, the, the chances that these issues are addressed in a better way with a better representation on the Security Council, um, this would offer a better perspective for, um, for the future of the Security Council, future of the UN. Um, uh, so I think this is a sort of underlying theme that really uh, has to be addressed in order to be able to solve some of these specific issues that were mentioned. Also, there is uh, um, uh, issue he mentioned, the referral issues. Uh, I also wonder whether uh, when the Security Council would be reformed, uh, his concerns, his three concerns could be dealt with. And I'm not as pessimistic as he is in that regard. I remember that in 1998, uh, when the Rome Statute was signed, and also in 2002, when the Rome Statute entered into force, nobody thought that there would ever be a referral soon uh, to, uh, to the ICC, but still this happened. So uh, I might bet with 
the, the DM, DM said it will take a long, 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 long time before this will happen again. Um, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and, uh, but underlying this is certainly an urgent need. I'm strongly convinced of that to make the Security Council more representative and also more legitimate and more credible. That is really uh, the uh, well, not so much the elephant in the room, I think, but really uh, we should try to do everything possible to to create a sort of pressure, public opinion pressure, etc. That uh, that this is going to be taken up more seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dire. To you. Um, thank you very much. I had the burden of handling the Security Council reform file um, in my time in New York, so I have a lot to say on the substance. Um, I will avoid that and instead say, um, so one of the things that, um, that I often used to say about Security Council reform is that um, if my son, uh, who at the time was 12 years old, um, ever became a diplomat, um, he would probably also have to inherit this file. Um, in short, I simply don't think that it can happen. Um, and it's not, um, it's not just because of Article 108. I think Article 108 is certainly the big driver, but I think even amongst member states, the, the dynamics are such that um, because uh, different groups of member states want to see reform in different ways, um, it's it's hard even beyond the P5 um, to actually see a possibility um, um, uh, of reaching agreement. There's absolutely no question that if we had to draft the UN Charter today, it would look very different. I mean, my vision of what a UN Security Council should look like um, is what the AU Peace and Security Council looks like. I mean, if you had to ask me, provide the perfect UN Security Council, it would simply be the AU Peace and Security um, Council. Would such a reformed council address my issue? Absolutely. Oops, I have a low battery. Um, 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 such a reformed Security Council would absolutely address my issues because the council would not be pushed by the threat of a veto into adopting things that are clearly counter um, the objectives um, of justice. By the way, I don't think that a future referrals under these circumstances is necessarily optimistic. I think it is pessimistic if the idea is that the same resolution are going to be adopted for some other genocide. That's not necessarily for me a good thing because again, I think it's counter um, the interest of justice and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll follow the same order, Shamala. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I share the pessimism you've just heard from Derry. Um, I used to say, I think when people ask me this, it's probably not in my lifetime, but it sounds like maybe even longer. Um, we've seen sort of, you know, um, spurts of energy um, around it in the GA. And I have to say for a Security Council report, we don't get to write about it because it never comes into the Security Council. Um, the way in which I think, you know, given that it's such a difficult issue and it's going to take a while, is to look at, um, and there is a question about what elected members can do in the chat. And I think that is the way to sort of try and address it in the meantime, that elected members can come in and try to push certain things and, and, and be, be there to, to, to sort of hold the P5 accountable as much as you know, possible. There are 10 elected members. We have seen, I think, a, you know, real um, coming together of the E10 as, we, as they are now called more than in previous years. And it is in, in reaction to what they have seen among the P5 and, and you know, issues like Syria, where there's the veto, there have been 16 vetoes on Syria from Russia. Um, 10 of those were shared with China. You know, it is very hard to get certain things going. So, but so, so just my last sort of point is that I think there could be, and there has been in the past, but it seems to have died down, this idea of pushing for veto restraint where, on certain situations. And I know that was um, highlighted earlier. I, I think that is something they should try to, to do because it could allow for some movement on issues that are, are stuck in the council. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Shamala. So Tony, you have the privilege of having the last word. Uh, thanks. Um, unhappily, I share everyone's pessimism. I can't see it happening. Um, I guess uh, then the question is, what are the alternatives? So again, we might think about what the General Assembly could do or what the International Court of Justice could do, uh, you know, what the other organs in the United Nations can do to establish a, 
a sound, uh, you know, sorry, you know, uh, a sound uh, approach. In terms of the values that have to be upheld, they're very clear that the classic values, democracy, participation, the rule of law, as Gandhi said when he was asked what he thought of Western civilization, I think it would be a good idea. So all those things, you know, rule of law, participation, democracy, all those things would be a good idea for the Security Council, but I can't see it happening. Uh, but then I should also, uh, so I think maybe other organs of the United, United Nations might have to be more active as they have been sometimes in the past. So I'm really glad, for example, that the ICJ did not decline jurisdiction in the Lockerbie case, for instance. I think that was very important um, uh, when it came to the merits phase. Uh, you know, it, it was going to the merits phase. Uh, it's a tragedy that the third world itself, which was united at the time of Bandung, has been split. So I think the P5 have, have also been very effective in splitting the developing countries into all these different factions and leaving them to fight it out among themselves to do the work. This is, you know, divided rule, another classic imperial, you could say, uh, another classic imperial strategy, which is working. But can I go back to what Shamala said, which is, if the Security Council is going to expand its operations to deal with things like climate change and all these other issues, what are the consequences of having a fundamentally biased, structurally tilted institution, which has no rule, which has no boundaries to its authority? It can declare anything pretty much to be a threat to peace and security. Niels, I hope you disagree with me, but I think it's going to be tough, right? <laughs> And so then the Security Council can claim, and we've seen this happening before, all these areas to be a threat to peace and security. The pandemic is a threat to peace and security. Climate change is a threat to peace and security. And then who's going to make the decision? It is going to be that same structurally biased entity that is going to make a decision and which has the power under Article 25 to make rules that are binding on everybody else. So that is, no, we like to think that it's good that the Security Council gets involved in all these other, other issues. Well, I, I disagree with that. So that would be my final. I just wanted to pile on the pessimism here, you know, since we're all into it. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, that's what I think Twale scholarship has to offer, you know, to think about the co co consequences. Once we see international law from this lens, let's follow through and see what the con consequences are going to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, I think we have to stop here. Um, I wanted perhaps to turn this uh, tide of pessimism um, in um, a slightly more optimistic note that I think we, we need to discuss these issues. I mean, it's important that we discuss uh, these issues, that we discuss them with the different perspectives that we've heard the, around the table today. And, and certainly um, uh, we'll probably We'll keep discussing it. Our kids will keep discussing it and the generations to come uh, because um, uh, although we criticize um, uh, the United Nations, um, it's certainly better uh, than not having it and uh, and, and, and then probably uh, if we were, and again, coming back to the parallel um, that was being made um, uh, also in the chat with the League of Nations uh, in one of the first questions, uh, I, mean, I, I think it's certainly if we were to have, you know, a, a creating moment of a new international organization uh, at the moment, I'm not sure we would have an organization as good, uh, even with all its defaults uh, as the United Nations. So I think we have to um, uh, stick with what have and, and try to you know look at uh, uh, the positive aspects uh, the role uh, that uh, Shabala mentioned um, about um, uh, the role of um, uh, the elected um, uh, the elected members the non-permanent members uh, is very important and also of the other institutions uh, like the General Assembly and the ICJ and so I would end um, on that note thanking very much all our panelists and uh, thanking again the Center for International Law uh, the legal department of the Portuguese MFA and uh, the recording of this and also I mean all the participants and they're very interesting questions that we didn't have time to address all uh, but the recording um, of this webinar will be available at the CIL website and the Facebook uh, page so uh, we hope that um, uh, many people can watch it and learn from it as much as we've learned today and uh, we look forward uh, for other events and uh, invite um, everybody to keep uh, following uh, the events that uh, CIL is organizing. So thank you so much.
Um, it was a pleasure moderating the session and uh, take care and all the best for everybody. Thank you.